The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Next on Life Today, Bible teacher and author Beth Moore explains that Jesus gave flesh and bone to the outstretched hand of God. One of the first things we do is let that tiny little hand wrap around our finger. Think of all this because she's holding the infant Christ. He's wrapping his tiny little hand around her finger and that hand had cast and flung stars and planets into the sky. Thank you all. Thank you for being an encouragement. We welcome you to life today. Uh, Betty and I are thrilled to always tell you that Beth Moore is about to share, and she's talking about the mighty hand of God. And, uh, you know, but she, does she just have a, a natural, let's say, gifting of God that, that the zeal and enthusiasm she has is contagious? Absolutely. You don't have to be around her very long until you pick it. It, it catches. <laughs> it, it jumps all, all over you. It gets all over you. <laughs> Betty has written a... Uh, uh, really, is, it's a, let's say, a compilation of things that God has done in her life. And it's a 40-day devotional guide. And, and, and really, uh, she's talking about Free to Be Me, which is her story uh, in the book that's her life story. And of course, interestingly, I'm quite a bit of that story. <laughs> we'll give you an opportunity to get these books and to have an opportunity to give someone a cup of water. And I think you're going to like that. Here's Beth Moore talking about the mighty hand of God. Welcome, Beth. And so number two is this. Jesus gave flesh and bones to the outstretched hand of God. Tell me what number two is. Jesus gave flesh and bones to the outstretched hand do any of you remember when he said to his disciples, listen, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I mean, he came to God taking on flesh to dwell among us. And so I want you to just try to get this with me. Over the hundreds of times in the Old Testament that the hand of God is referred to, the hand of God Literally, flesh wraps around the very hand of God and comes to dwell among people on planet Earth. It is fascinating to me that his hand took on the glove of flesh. And I want you to try to get that picture with me because the hand is a very, very fascinating instrument. I don't know when the last time you really thought about what you've got going on here, but even if you've got a pen in your hand, you're doing some kind of fascinating engineering every time you write something down. Every time you do something with these appendages, when you fix your daughter's hair, or you um, build something um, at home or at work, or you paint something, something fascinating is going on here. And he created the hand, and then he came and filled up the hand, this mighty outstretched hand of God. In your one little hand, you got 27 bones. Anybody? 27 bones. You have got 206 bones in the human body, but over half of those are in your hands and feet. Now just get this with me because here this young teenager Mary is told that she is going to bear the son of the most high God. The Holy Spirit would pass upon her and she would bear the holy son of God. So picture this because when she has him, by the time she can pull herself together enough to think, God help us mothers, God help us mothers, we know what that is like. By the time she could have a clear thought, what was she doing? She was looking at that Hand. One of the first ways an infant will involuntarily respond is to eat. But to vo voluntarily respond in communication with someone else will be the reach of the hand. One of the first things we do is let that tiny little hand wrap around our finger. Think of all this because she's holding the infant Christ. He's wrapping his tiny little hand around her finger and that hand 
had cast and flung stars and planets into the sky. It's just too much. It's just too much. The hands of Christ, the construction of his hands, he had formed man from his hands and here he is. So here's what I want you to do with me over the next um, little while. I want us to look in the Gospel of Mark. Turn there with me. You're going to start even in the first uh, chapter. We are going to look at a series of places in the remaining part of our emphasis on the hand of God. We are going to see the hand of God through the hand of Jesus Christ. When he specifically in the Gospel of Mark took his hand to something because I pray that that will have a whole new meaning to us as we have built that acrostic that we know our hand is about the hand of God upon us is about holiness and anointing and it's about the the name of Jesus it's about doing mighty deeds and we're going to watch what happens when Christ who could have just thought it and it be so instead stretched out his mighty hand. That's what I want you to see. It's over and over in the Gospel of Mark. I wish we could look at every single time it comes up, but I want you to look, first of all, Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, 40 and 42. 40 through 42, Mark 1. We would have already seen it with, with Peter's mother-in-law when he raised her up from her sick bed. but I want you to just... If you would, focus with me on verses 40 through 42 in Mark 1. It says, And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Move with pity. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean clean. You you want to know something really odd? I don't have any kind of big statement to make on it. It's just very, very, uh, very interesting and intriguing. The Bible never speaks of healing leprosy. It always speaks of cleaning it, being made clean. Now, let me tell you, I don't know if you've ever been near a leper's uh, colony, but I have because there are some in India. And let me tell you, even driving near it, Even through the air conditioning in the car with the windows rolled up, it is an unimaginable odor. Just the pure um, skin just uh, just rotting on those bones. It's just it's it's horrible, and it's so uh, so isolating to them. So I want you to see in your mind this leper coming to Jesus and it says that he kneels down before him and he literally, I mean, he implores him. This is a begging he's doing. If you will, you you know, you can make me clean. It says that Jesus was moved with pity and he stretched out his hand and he touched him. He didn't have to touch him. He could have just said it and it was done. But it was the touch. It was the touch that said, you're worthy to me. That even in all your uncleanness, I cannot tell you what it means to me to know that Jesus Christ is clean enough for both of us. Anybody else? I got to know that. I got, you need to know that today. Jesus Christ is clean enough for you both. So when he touches you, you become clean. You become clean. Because what he touches, he cleanses with his holiness, and it says immediately this leprosy left him and he was made clean. Glory, glory to God. I want you to look a little further in Mark chapter 7, verse 31. Mark chapter 7, verse 31. I'm going to read you an account that I am just fascinated by right now, and I pray that that you will be as well. But I'm going to intentionally break it up into parts so that you won't look any further. Let's sit on a little part of it for a while, and then we'll take up the next. Mark 7, verses 31 through 34, and then we'll hold on it, and then read 35 to 37. It says in Mark 7, verse 31, Then he, Jesus, returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. After taking, I'm at verse 33, after taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Aphatha, that is, be opened. Aphatha, be 
open. Okay, here's the part I want you to see. Because this to me is the joy of Bible study. When you read a passage enough to where one word sticks out and you go, why is that there? And there's a word here I find very, very interesting. It says he takes him, they come begging him to lay his hand on him because he's deaf, he's got a speech impediment. 33, he takes him aside from the crowd privately. He put, let's, let's just get to this in a minute, puts his fingers into his ears. What in the world is that about? Uh, and then go, go with me to spitting. Uh, and then we've got a whole new kind of scenario here. But this is the part that really gets me. Verse 34, he looks up to heaven and he sighs. What? What is that? What is that? Because I mean like, about to perform a miracle, stretching forth your hand, you're going to go. <sighs> <laughs> I mean, we know it wasn't a bother to Jesus. He wasn't bothered by him coming. So I mean, when I saw, I'm usually frustrated. I mean, what, what in the world is he sighing about? Like, Lord, I mean, this is, uh, Jesus, this is awkward. This is an awkward time. There are awkward times for a sigh. This is an awkward time for a sigh. Unless we see where it's used, that very same Greek word or form of it is used in other passages. Now, if you look in your NIV or your NAS or your King James Version or your Holman Christian Standard, they all have sighed or deeply sighed. The, the lexical term for it is stenazo, stenazo. I'm going to spell it to you just in case you like words like this, S-T-E-N-A-Z-O, stenazo, stenazo. And now I want you to hear, the reason why I'm bringing up that Greek word is it's used several other times in the New Testament, and I want you to hear exactly where. I'm going to read it to you. You can write down the passages and where they belong as I read them. First of all, write down Romans 8, 23. Then write down 2 Corinthians 5, 2 and 4. And then I'm going to come back and read to you Romans 8, 26. Write that down. Leave something here in Mark 8 because I think you're going to want to see these Romans passages. Turn with me to Romans and have it wide open. Now, what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to see uh, where this word is translated in other places in Scripture to help us understand why, in our context of all things, Jesus decides to sigh before he performs this miracle completely. I mean, like, what, what is that? Why the sigh? And it is so, so fascinating. Look at Romans 8, 23, Romans 8, 23, and look at this wording. It says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. I want to read that again. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, we're already told that all creation groans. We ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Do you see that word groan in many of your translations? That is the same word, stenazo. Stenazo, that is a word that is translated here to groan. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 2 and 4. It says, for in this tent, and the Apostle Paul is talking about the physical uh, body of man, for in this tent we groan, there we go again, that's stenazo, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, for while we are still here in this tent, we groan, that is a form of stenazo so again, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now stay here with me because then we begin to understand a little bit about why that word would be used in that context when someone comes to him with that kind of an issue, that kind of special needs, that kind of pain that they've lived through, uh, through the deafness and through the speech impediment, not being able to hear what they're saying, but not being able to make what they're saying understandable to the person who can here talk about isolation but what if we stick grown in it what well, suddenly something different happens because now with that in mind I want you to just think about what it is that he takes him to the side he uh, take, puts his fingers in his ears he literally touches it spits and touches his tongue he looks up to heaven and he 
in, if we were to use the word in, in Romans 8, he groans, not just sighs. He's not just in a bad mood. He's not just like, well, I'm really tired today. I'm like, one more miracle today. <laughs> but no, he's groaning. Every time it is used in that context, when we hear it in Romans 8, and I'm about to read it to you again, certainly true in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it is about the groaning of wearing these earthly bodies. The groaning of it. To think about what it meant for God to be limited to this flesh. Think about the pain of it. Listen, okay, for instance, I have a friend who has a daughter that has had a long time relationship with painkillers, a long time relationship. As it often happens, they were prescribed at first. She developed an addiction. Then she be, began to I get it through other means. Listen, I get addiction, so I'm not casting any kind of stone. But when she was trying to come off of it, everything hurt. Everything. Why? Because she was used to having the pain killed. So listen, can you imagine what it would be like because she'd gone from painlessness to suddenly every part, your, your wrist hurts, your knees hurt, your feet hurt. I mean, she was young. But if we could go from no pain to these bodies, we'd be going like, whoo, this thing hurts. Like he knew what it was to be thirsty. Uh, he, he knew what it was to have to be hungry. I mean, how annoying would that be to be God and go, we're going to have to stop and eat? Are you kidding me? I mean, are you kidding me? <laughs> We're going to have to drive through Jack in the Box? Are you kidding? I'm, I'm God here. There's something wrong with this picture here. I have no needs here, and suddenly I'm stricken with needs. And so what I believe is happening back in this context is that he is groaning over man's dealing with his own body of flesh. He gets it. Listen, I love this. This is a different form of the word. This is the noun form of the words to not so. But listen to Romans 8, 26. It says, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings, form us to not so, too deep for words. Okay. Okay. Stay with me. Lord, please help me explain this well. All right. So when we come to Jesus with our need Somebody watching today, no telling how many people, are, you may be dealing with cancer treatment, uh, pain from cancer, the sickness of the treatment, uh, also many other kinds of maladies. You might have a, a back injury. Uh, you might have been born uh, with uh, special needs that causes you continual physical pain. Maybe you've got the flu. Maybe you've got a stomach virus. Maybe your heart is so broken. I know what it's like to have your heart so broken that it feels like pain. It feels like you're going to, like your chest is going to break. It takes on a physical pain. Do you know that God so enters in that when he prays for you in your pain, he groans. He groans. Jesus knew what it was like to take on the physical body, to feel what it was like to be beaten, slashed, to be crucified, to be hung up, to be nearly suffocated um, in his own blood. He knew what that was like. And so the Spirit enters in and intercedes. When you come to Him with your groaning, Jesus gets it. He gets it. I, I hope you get it, what Beth said, because He gets it. And you know what? He really wants to give you all of Him. And He can you can experience the mighty hand of God. You know something else that we can experience? We can be, in so many ways, the hands of God. And, uh, you know, we're going to give you an opportunity to get these uh, His Word is Life cups. You, you know what this is? A coffee cup. I mean, if Starbucks had these cups, they'd be successful. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> it is amazing what people have told us about these cups that we gave years ago. They say, we've chipped ours. We've just had, we, we, please get us more. Let me tell you something. We're going to send them to you if you'll do one thing that Jesus said is really important. Give a cup of water, a cup of water in his name. What if you could give a well? He said, if you give a cup, you won't lose your reward. What about a well? I, I don't think it has a thing to do with you getting riches. I think the great riches is knowing what you've done when you express love. I want you to watch this. Watch it closely. 
Lucette's story is not all that uncommon in Madagascar. She lives with her two children in a tiny shack in this poverty-stricken village. Lucette and her family don't have the means or access to clean drinking water. So she walks each day to a contaminated river. But the burden of collecting this dirty water is no match to the burden of sorrow and grief that pierces her heart every time she goes to the river. Even though the pain of Lucette's loss is reawakened with each scoop of deadly water, she longs for the day of never having to return to this river for her drinking water. Dear Jesus, I want you to give her peace. Let us be an answer to her hope, her dreams, her prayer, her need. In Jesus' name. I have been saying to those of you who watch us, if you watch many times, you'll hear me say, if you want your prayers answered, your prayers, seek to be an answer to someone else's prayers. Well, we can be. We, we can be an answer, Betty, to mm -hmm. her hope and her prayers. We can drill a water well in her area. In all the little village areas around, we can drill them a well. We have targeted 500 areas for this year. Now think about what I'm saying. Because of someone like you doing what you can to give a cup of water or a part of a well, you've drilled 4,000 wells to change everything for the people in those areas. We're asking you to help us touch another 12 countries, 500 areas and drill wells. Could you drill one? The average cost remains. I don't know how long it'll stay this but it remains $4,800. That's the average. Some wells, we have to go deeper. It's a little more expensive. Some will be a little shallower. It's a little less, but the average is $4,800. If you can drill a well, I know you'll want to. If you can give a portion of a well. We ask our friends to pray about giving $1,200 and pray three join you or $2,400 and pray one joins you. And we've got a well. But Betty, most of our viewers will give $48. And that gives 10 people water, basically, for the rest of their life. How would you like to make a $48 gift that gave 10 people clean water? 10 mothers like that. You can. $144 triples it. That's 30 people water for the rest of their life. Now, we're going to send you some gifts to bless you. We're going to send you cups that people have asked for. These are wonderful coffee cups, and they are so comfortable and so nice it's the only thing Betty and I use. We actually, if we go out of town, we take a couple of them with us. I mean, they're just that nice. People have said, could we get some more? We have friends over now, and we'll tell them where we got them. Yes, you can. All we're asking you to do is make a gift to help us drill those wells. We're asking you to make a gift of over $100. We're going to send Betty's devotional book, Her Life Story, which I thank God I'm included in. 51 <laughs> years we've been married, and we went together several years before that. Free to be me. It'll be a blessing. We're sending this just to say thank you for whatever gift you make. If you can give a well or a large gift toward the well, we're sending you the beautiful, beautiful painting by Thomas Kincaid. It's hanging here in our studio. It's a canvas, and it is beautiful. It's the Forest Chapel, and I'm telling you, it's inspirational. If you will simply go right now, please get your bank card, go to the phone, dial the number, and make the gift God put on your heart. Use that card like it's a check. You can go online, lifetoday.org, and make the gift. Whatever God leads you to do, please make that gift today. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing it. If you write a check, make it to life, but call us and tell us what you're sending in. Thank you for being an answer to a mother's prayer and a miracle for her family. 
Every day, millions of children are forced to make a dreadful choice. Drink filthy, polluted water filled with deadly disease or die from thirst. No child should ever be faced with this decision. The good news is there is a solution. Mission Water for Life is one of the most exciting and viable demonstrations of God's love in the world today. Suffering can end because clean water changes everything. With your gift today, we can establish and drill 500 water wells for remote villages in over 12 different nations. Your gift of $24 will help provide clean water for five people. A gift of $48 will help provide for 10 people. $72 will impact 15 people. And $144 will help provide fresh, clean, disease-free water for 30 people for a lifetime. With your gift, you'll receive the brand new Free To Be Me 40-Day Devotional where Betty shares the challenges, victories, and insights God gave her while struggling through fear and insecurity. You'll also receive Betty's book, Free To Be Me. With your gift of $100 or more, you may request Life's Inspirational Coffee Mug Set, featuring encouraging quotes and scripture to brighten your mornings for years to come. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,200 to help provide water for 250 people or a gift of $4,800 to help sponsor a complete well and request this beautifully framed canvas print of the Forest Chapel by the painter of light, Thomas Kincaid. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. I really hope that if you can, that you'll, you know, of course, make a gift and ask for the, uh, the coffee mugs. Uh, yeah, you're going to love them if you don't have them. If you've got them, you'll want more. I know you will. But get the, uh, the Forest Chapel by Kincaid. It's hanging here in our studio. It's just beautiful. It comes framed just like you see it. It's a canvas. And we're asking you to help us drill a well by making a gift toward a $4,800 drilling for the well of $1,200 or more. You give $1,200, pray three people join you. We've got a well. You may be able to give a well. I know many of you are praying to that end, and I thank you for it. But whatever you can do, we thank you for it. And to you here in the audience, thank you so much for being with us. And thank all of you for watching Life Today. I mean, I'm literally screaming on the inside. Oh, he just went outside and started shooting. Tomorrow on Life Today. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.